Thank you so very much and uh, welcome everyone. Um, uh, there is a description of Arrive and I uh, want to thank them for hosting uh, this webinar today. Um, and uh, um, uh, fasten your seatbelts, uh, we've got a lot to talk about. Uh, certainly a volatile time in the markets, so uh, the financial markets, so um, much of what's happening out there in the freight flows uh, becomes even more interesting, more, even more important. Um, uh, um, for most of you know, may know me, if you don't, uh, uh, that's me. Um, and let me tell you a bit about our firm. Um, what we pride ourselves on is having uh, one of the largest, if not the largest database of, of transportation goods flow, um, what I would call a data lake, um, every mode you can imagine, um, especially in North America, uh, but many of those data feeds ex extend to uh, internationally. Um, we provide, uh, use that to provide insights uh, into investing in the transportation industry for people who manage money for pension funds, hedge funds, mutual funds, money professional money managers, but also use that data to uh, provide insights uh, to those who manage companies uh, in the transportation universe. Um, anyway, uh, that's what we do. Um, this is what we're gonna talk about. Um, we've got a number of things today, so let's just go ahead and jump right in. Um, one of the first things I always wanna point out to folks is that we have changed fundamentally in so many ways the way we run our businesses, the way we manage our affairs, not only professionally, but personally. Uh, uh, the, the smartphone has become almost ubiquitous. Uh, the personal computer, uh, we not we don't just have one we have we have several of them um, we own uh, more personal computers than we own cars and uh, the ownership of a car used to be the epitome of 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 the Amer of the american experience uh, most of us have uh, two or more computers if you count the the one at work the one at home and, and or elsewhere um, Yet, despite all this modernization, the way we account for things in the economy hasn't changed at all. The method by which we determine what the GDP was is a method that was uh, derived over 80 years ago. Uh, the method by which we try to steer the economy, uh, the Federal Reserve, uh, is using methodologies that it used decades ago, very successfully decades ago, but uh, not uh, as uh, innovative, not responding to technology. So the first thing I wanna say is, what if everything you know is wrong? What if we should be changing the way we're steering the economy, measuring the economy? And let me just give you a basic example. So let's look at inflation. Uh, in front of you is CPI, inflation over the last 100 years. And uh, we've seen it go very high, we've seen it go very low, but especially over the last 30 plus years, it's been in a decidedly downward decline. So let's go back and look at history. Historically, uh, the Federal Reserve has used money supply to guide inflation, to create inflation when it was needed and to kill it when it uh, got too high and we got out of hand. So you can look at specific periods. This is the post-World War I through the end of World War II timeframe. And again and again, you see the dark green line go down and inflation uh, money supply, and then you, the light green line inflation follows. Money supply goes up uh, and indeed it takes a little bit of time so often, but, but inflation follows, it goes up uh, again and again the Federal Reserve using money supply is able to create inflation when it wants it, needs it, and destroy inflation when, it, when, it, when, when, when necessary. Uh, that pattern continues post-World War II, really through the 70s, uh, very effective tool to both create and destroy inflation as the Federal Reserve sees fit. Um, 
that pattern continued in the in the early 70s but by the 80s uh although they were very effective at killing the voker in particular was very effective at killing inflation in the early 80s um they began to lose control and money supply is a, is a methodology of of uh, driving inflation uh up and down began to cease to be effective if you look at the more recent history so the last 20 years what you see is a pattern in which it seems to have no relationship whatsoever or very little in fact in order to actually see any relationship you have to expand uh, uh, the scale by ten fold in other words you have to take the amount of inflation created and multiply it by ten uh, or or decrease the amount of money supply by what to one tenth of the amount in order to see any relationship at all and you can see that that dark green line going straight straight up that is actually qe1 that second uh, jump up is qe2 and the third jump up is qe3 quantitative easing and yet despite those uh, they really were not able to create any material meaningful amounts of inflation in fact quite frankly despite the best attempts of all of the central banks in the industrialized world, we haven't been able to not only create inflation of any material amounts here in the United States, but we haven't really been able to create any material amounts of inflation in, in most of the modern economy, in most in, uh, whether it's Japan or Germany or uh, uh, Great Britain, you, you pick a country, uh, they have all struggled, all the central banks have struggled to do something that Historically, they've been very successful. You can you can give a Federal Reserve, give central banks globally uh, a grade on what they are and are not able to do. And usually one of the things they're extraordinarily good at is creating inflation and usually uh, a little bit more painful, but they're actually usually pretty good at being able to kill inflation as well. And they seem to have just lost control. So if money supply isn't capable of creating money uh, inflation, why is that? What has changed? Well, my thesis on it is very simple. If you go back and you look at the last post-Civil War to current pre uh, time frame, uh, the bond cycle, the inflation cycle in the United States was essentially a 60-year cycle. Uh, sometimes it varied by a couple of years, but it was essentially a 30-year period in which inflation did nothing but go up and, in, and, and interest rates did nothing go up, go, but go up, followed by a period of roughly 30 years in which inflation did nothing but go down and interest rates did nothing but go down. And certainly the, the, the post-World War II, 1948, 1950 period through 1980 period was one in which slowly but steadily interest rates went up and in, as, a, as a result of inflation slowly but steadily going up. And uh, as uh, everyone tried to stimulate growth, including the Federal Reserve until finally things got overheated and we had uh, uh, the opposite. And we had a 30 year period, 1980 through uh, 2008, 2009, in which interest rates did nothing but go down and, and, and inflation did nothing but go down. And uh, the Federal Reserve started to, uh, in earnest try to reignite some inflation uh, uh, coming out of the uh, 09 recession, 08, 09 recession. And has been a, unable to. And for the first five years or so, I and a lot of other talking heads, uh, self-proclaimed prognosticators, said, well, th wise, very intelligent things like, well, you know, eventually rates will have to go up. Well, you know, eventually uh, we're going to see uh, in inflation uh, reignited because you can't have all of this easy money and not have inflation. Well, that's been interesting. And uh, we were all wrong for five plus years. And then uh, about three years ago, I decided I was tired of being wrong. I really don't like being wrong. I get to be wrong on a regular basis because I'm human and I'm trying to predict the future. But that said, I don't like it. And so why was I wrong? And so I got, uh, went back and, and restudied this. And here's what I came away with. What if the true lasting effect of technology is that to actually deflate? pricing is to, to, to not only uh, kill inflation, but actually create deflation in the economy. 
We all know that Moore's Law, Gordon Moore, one of the co-founders of Intel, came up with Moore's Law uh, 40 years ago. And uh, Gordon said uh, essentially that the power of the processor would double and the cost of that microprocessor would get cut in half every 18 months for the foreseeable future. And we all know that Moore's Law has stayed on course. My tech friends now tell me that because of the physical limitations of silicon, it's really more like 20 months, but the point is, is that every year and a half or so, we're seeing the power of that microprocessor double and the cost of that microprocessor get cut in half. It's easy to see how that's deflationary for hardware, but it's also deflationary for software because if you're not constantly writing additional lines of code, your software, to take advantage of that increased processing power, very quickly, your software it becomes passe, it becomes, um, um, not, 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 not worth anything. So it's highly deflationary, not only to hardware, but it's highly deflationary to software. What all of that increased processing power and increased uh, software power has led to is disintermediation. So if you look at every single industry out there in which we have a middleman, you look at insurance, banking, investing, travel, music, you, you name it, we have seen the elimination of the middleman. And, and, in, and in the elimination of the middleman, you have, um, you have um, uh, eliminated costs. You're given price visibility to unsophisticated buyers of m complex markets. You've given quality visibility to unsophisticated buyers in consumer markets, and, and, and especially in what I call you know, B2C marketplaces. This isn't really as true in B2B marketplaces. And one of the reasons that those who predict that somehow freight brokerage is gonna be disintermediated or missing the point, that's a B2B marketplace and a marketplace in which you're dealing with sophisticated buyers. All the disintermediation so far has happened in B2C marketplaces in which you're dealing with unsophisticated buyers. Big difference and, and, and very important difference. We've seen uh, labor be deflated. Uh, you literally can work from anywhere. Um, you can work from home, call the uh, Dell help desk and, and uh, you'll probably get someone who, who lives in India. Uh, and uh, they may have a slight accent. Uh, they may not speak uh, the English language the exact same way you do, but their technical competence, their understanding of how your computer works and how to fix it remotely is uh, very competent. Um, We've seen productivity increase faster than demand for labor in market after market, and that's deflationary. Um, qualification and activity can be closely monitored. Um, I can have associates working in Chicago, Dallas, and elsewhere, and still see exactly what they're doing. We may talk on the phone a couple times a day, but um, I can closely monitor what they're doing. Salesforce based in Boston. Uh, I don't know how many phone calls they made, how many emails they responded to. Uh, through my client resource, uh, my CRM, I know exactly what they're doing uh, any and every day and how effective they're, they're being, how many mistakes they're making. All of that is deflationary. Agriculture is probably the greatest example. You know, here we are in the United States with some of the most expensive farmland out there. Um, and we run, you know, a, uh, what is a, a quarter million dollar tractor that that, that tills, uh, fertilize, and plants all in one pass on a, on a, on a field that may be laser leveled, literally. Uh, it, it's custom fertilized a little, not just average across the, the field, but via a satellite scan, a little bit more nitrogen here, a little bit more uh, phosphate over there, um, so that it produces the, most, the greatest yield, and then it followed up by a, whatever, half a million dollar combine. Uh, and despite all of that capital, that technology allows us to produce that bushel of corn, bushel of rice, you name it, cheaper than anywhere else in the world. Uh, and uh, some poor soul with his water buffalo sticking rice fronds down in the muck one at a time in Asia, uh, despite only wanting $200 a year in income to, to, to uh, support his family, cannot compete with the farmer uh, in uh, the Midwest who's driving a new Lincoln uh, or a new uh, pickup truck 
and living in a nice house and sending kids to college and uh, uh, living uh, uh, and farming thousands of acres um, every year. Uh, manufacturing is another great example. We're actually stealing jobs back from, forget China, Vietnam. Um, uh, because, uh, I don't know, the Packard engine plant for me was an epiphany in, in Mississippi. I remember going to a, a Caterpillar engine plant, stories about Caterpillar uh, engine plants, manufacturing plants years ago when you'd go and plant floor was populated by, by you know, hundreds of workers smoking cigarettes, talking about what time beer 30 was, talking about the football game, et cetera. And uh, now uh, the Packard engine plant in, in Mississippi um, it has no workers on it. It's machines making machines. There are a few people off to the side looking at computer screens that are monitoring the machines making machines, but there is no labor uh, uh, on the floor. And so what the cost of labor is, is irrelevant because there isn't any labor. Uh, we're seeing machine uh, shops here in the U.S. Um, in which uh, we're completely eliminating labor. And as a result, uh, we can be highly uh, competitive uh, and, by the way, that's deflationary. Uh, fracking is probably the greatest example. This is an American-derived technology. In fact, everyone in the world is still trying to figure out how we do what we do. Now, make no mistake, fracking, the concept of going, uh, putting an explosive charge down in a, a well to try and free it up because of the tar or, uh, being gummed up by the waxes that are inherent in the petroleum uh, extraction process that's not new. That's been going on for 80, 90 years. But the concept of drilling down 10,000 plus feet, then turning and going laterally through the source rock uh, and setting off controlled explosions, uh, forcing what's called propellant and sand into the, the cracks, uh, the essentially open up capillaries and then sucking out natural gas and, and oil from that previously unattainable source, um, the epiphany on how to do it actually happened at the very depth of the financial crisis in February of 2009 in the Eagleford Shale. Since figuring out how to do that, we have been perfecting it. We now get eight, nine, 10 times as much oil and natural gas out of each fracked well as we did back in 2009. Um, and Despite everyone else trying to figure out how we do it, the Saudis, the Japanese, the Germans, the Chinese, everyone trying to figure out how we do it, no one yet has figured out how we do it in the United States. That said, the U.S. has gone from being a, a net importer of oil to an exporter. We have gone from, uh, the, for years, the Saudis were the world's largest producer of oil. Uh, the U.S. is now not only the world's largest producer of oil, but we're the world's largest producer of oil by a factor of a Kuwait. So add Kuwait and Saudi Arabia together and you still, uh, that's what it takes to get to the size of the U.S. production. Um, and that result of this is, is, is that we have put a lid on the cost of oil. So despite any political unrest, we don't see oil spiking up. You know, we have a, a bit of a controversy right now with the Saudis. Uh, it appears that they killed a journalist. Um, and in the, yet, despite that, we oil, oil prices have actually gone down, not up. Uh, uh, with that as the headline, uh, might I suggest that if it weren't for our ability to frack uh, and the amount of oil we produce as a country, that headline might, might have the exact opposite effect on the, the global price of oil. So uh, I remember having a conversation with Boone Pickens, who at one point was the largest, one of the largest owners of natural gas in the United States. And Boone was pointing out that if you look at, at our fracking activity, if you look at what happens in the U.S., we have what's called freehold status. That is, if you own the acre of land, you own straight down to the core. Everywhere else in the world, someone else, the government either owns outright or controls somehow uh, the, that mineral rights below the first uh, six inches of dirt. So if you look at a, a, a map of the U.S. and Mexico, if you look at a, a Google map picture uh, along the uh, U.S. border, it's pockmarked with fracking activity and just directly across the border in Mexico, there's no activity at all. And Boone says to me, you know, you can't convince me that the source rock on the other side of the Rio Grande is any different. But the economic incentive for the Texas rancher is there, the economic incentive for the Mexican government 
is not and they don't have the technology and so we're they're not fracking even though the source rock would allow them to extract oil and natural gas in fact if you look at shale deposits around the world it's almost everywhere uh, the largest single uh, source rock uh, for natural gas is actually under China and right now uh, a thousand cubic feet of natural gas in China will cost you over 13 bucks in the US it'll cost you three. So basically it'll cost you um, roughly, you know, four times as much for uh, natural gas uh, there as it does here. But they haven't figured out how to do what we do. My thesis is really simple. We've already capped the cost of oil globally with our production, with our technology that's deflationary um, but that over the next five to ten to fifteen years three things are going to happen either a we're going to go do it for them b they're we're going to license it to them or c they're going to steal it probably a combination of those three but the bottom line is is that for the foreseeable future for the next generation for decades to come we're going to have plenty of btus plenty of oil and natural gas because it exists everywhere and we now u.s developed to have a technology to which to unlock relatively inexpensively oil and natural gas. So that's deflationary. Going on. So right now there is in our society uh, the ability to do ever more wondrous things with technology. Not only is it deflationary, but it's ever increasing and fast moving. I would take everybody back to the 1970s. There was a guy named Alvin Toffler who wrote a book called Future Shock. It's an important to understand in predicting technology that you understand the principles of future shock. You don't have to read the book. I read it. Here's what, here's what the message. There are three steps to technology. First of all, you have to have, be able to do it in a lab. Watson, come here. You have to be able to, that's the phone. Uh, you have to be able to do it inexpensively in mass. You have to be able to, the Model T. It's one thing to be able to do it. It's another thing to be able to do it in mass inexpensively so that everyone can afford it and it can be adopted as part of everyday life. And the last thing is really the willingness to adopt it, the socialization. Self-driving vehicles are a great example of this. We can do it in a lab. We can actually do it in mass, but we're all still reticent to accept it. Now we're being socialized whether we accept it or not and we're in little ways. New cars have uh, the braking technology, so you really can't hit the car in front of you. The new cars have the virtual rumble strips, so you start to stray out of the lane. It, it, it tells you about it. But it's, other, it's coming at you from other angles. Yeah, uh, you get in the car and, and in the morning and the phone, the phone tells you how many minutes it takes to get to the office on the, on the uh, weekday, and it tells you how many minutes it's gonna take you to get to Home Depot on Saturday morning. Uh, it, starts to predict where you're going to go to lunch, when you're going to go, where you're going to go, et cetera. And it's technology's way of saying, it's okay. I got you. I know where you need to be. I know you need you to go and I can, can help you do that. The problem is, is, is that we see ever faster changes coming out as it tribes risk aversion because we have, it becomes, seems less easy to predict the future. I argue it's not. You just have to stop and realize what's happening. Realize the, the, about the three steps. Realize that just because it's possible doesn't mean we're gonna do it, and that makes the future a little easier to predict. Faster change also means we are less able to, to apply critical thought. Uh, we see again and again fake news of things that just aren't true, uh, and so we, we give up. Um, it means change happens more rapid and, and there's less value in brand. It's more value in actual personal relationships and less value in the actual brand. Um, it allows a reinforcement of the message that media has had forever, which is be afraid. Uh, media has always had that message, but instead of being, just being told that message once uh, at six o'clock by Walter Cronkite, you're told nonstop constantly because you're bombarded with media wherever you go. So that makes things more difficult. Let's talk about GDP. Uh, as I hinted earlier, GDP is calculated via a method you uh, created in 1937. And let me just point out some of the basic flaws. All imports are a negative, all exports are a positive. Okay, well, that fundamentally may have worked 80 years ago, but it's just wrong now. The simplest examples would be 
if I'm exporting the technology to build power turbines, I'm GE and I sell the Chinese the technology on how to build a power turbine for a billion dollars. That's now a positive to the US GDP, but it's a long-term negative to the US GDP. Why? Because they're never gonna buy a power turbine from GE from us ever again. When we, uh, imp when we may make many of the parts and pieces that go into an Apple phone here and other places throughout the world, and we move them to China where they're assembled, uh, that phone, in an assembled form is marked up to wholesale value and counted as an import into the US. Apple's a US company. Uh, the, it was designed here. The value differential between all those little parts and pieces and minus the uh, assembly labor, that big step up is a result of US intellectual property. And so the value of it coming in at wholesale value and being a negative to our GDP calculation just doesn't make sense. Um, and we have a, other dozens of examples, but the bottom line is, is, is it's an antiquated methodology. The other one is inventory adds to GDP. Uh, uh, all increases in inventory add to GDP, all decreases in inventory subtract from to GDP, which also is just wrong. Um, think about it this way. Uh, historically, it was, a, it was an increase in stored up value in your warehouse. Today, we look at that as you're not doing a very good job of managing your supply chain. So um, if you look at the second quarter as an example, we saw uh, inventories draw down so much in the second quarter that it was a full one percentage point negative to GDP. Um, that's, that is to say that the GDP reported would not have been 4.1%, it would have been 5.1% in the US if the subtraction, the drawing down of inventory hadn't been a negative to GDP. And those of us in the transport world like it when inventories come get lower because it means we're closer and closer to that point in time in which every consumption point drives incremental activity throughout the supply chain. Um, federal, state, and local governments use cash accounting. Everyone out there who runs something longer, larger than a lemonade stand uses accrual accounting. Yet governments use cash accounting. So we expense a, a battleship and fighter jet in the same period we expense a food stamp payment. I'm not saying one has a moral relevancy or importance greater than the other, but, but the food stamp payment is is consumed in the period, the battleship, the aircraft carrier, the bridge, the highway has a economic la life that lasts decades. And so it should be capitalized and depreciated like uh, you would in a business setting. We also talk about the national debt, but we don't talk about the national assets. Uh, the federal government obviously owns uh, hundreds of millions of acres of, of, of land and, and mineral assets and bandwidth uh, of, of the airwaves, et cetera. And uh, whether or not it's over, we're over levered is, is uh, not properly uh, assessed. We can point the finger at Congress and say the reason they can't make, think like businessmen and make good business decisions is because they're a bunch of lawyers, but that's really just not fair. You could put the best CEOs, CFOs, COOs uh, uh, in the world in, in as members of Congress and they, I don't know that they'd make better decisions because the methodology by which they're making those decisions is on cash basis accounting, not accrual basis. Uh, because of technology, we can use unverified sources, false fake data, widely disseminated and makes truth an even rare commodity. All of this leads to unintended consequence. People also in trying to predict the future don't realize that often the exact opposite of what you're trying to achieve is, is the outcome. Adobe's a great example. If I explained Adobe to you 30, 40 years ago, you'd say, well, that means no one will ever print office paper ever again. And indeed, uh, what it happens instead is it's easier to create documents. It's even easier to widely disseminate them. And so as a result, even if you don't, we don't print all of them, uh, even if only 10% of the ones created uh, are printed, um, uh, the consumption of office paper actually goes up, not down. Uh, social media, great example. It's supposed to drive interconnectivity, but the truth of the matter is, is it, it's, it's uh, reducing social skills uh, and 
all you have to do is know someone that's a, a teenager or even in their early 20s to see that uh, as a general rule, the social media has resulted in less social skills, not, not greater uh, connectivity. Um, autonomous trucks are gonna shift the liability and, and you're not gonna be able to sue the trucking company anymore. You're gonna, you're gonna get to, or the, tri, the driver, you're gonna sue um, the, um, uh, the OEM and it'll reduce profits for insurance companies because insurance companies make money not only on the underwriting gain, um, but the uh, but the investment gain and the investment gain is dependent upon having a huge pool and if you have fewer incidents then uh, the pool of investable assets out there will drop um, anyway let's talk about freight I, I like to tell people that are involved in, in in the transportation economy all the time that that you know more about what's going on in the economy than Wall Street does um, if you just stop quietly take a deep breath and trust what you know uh, you know more than plenty of people with PhDs in economics. Um, that said, this isn't your father's economy. Things are different than they were, and they've been changed dramatically uh, by technology. There's an ongoing right now uh, cadence of stories about how we're late in the cycle. We've been had an economic expansion since 2009, and that this is a long economy, that we're late in the cycle. I, I disagree. I say we're early in the cycle, and let me explain why. 2009 through 2014 was the first industrial-led recovery the United States has gone through since 1961. That said, when, we, when the price of oil fell in late 14 and into 15, we saw fracking activity cease, and we had a mini industrial recession in the United States. Late in 16, as oil came back above first 40, then 45, and into 50, it recovered, and away we've gone. We had no consumer cycle in the 09 through 16 timeframe. Uh, consumers just didn't grow income and they just didn't grow spending. So there really wasn't a consumer recovery. That has changed. Uh, we have seen in 17 and throughout 18, an improvement in consumer income and an improvement in consumer spending. And there's been a couple of reasons for it. I said this about oil. Uh, I will point out the third economy. There are three economies in the U.S. One's the industrial economy, one's the consumer economy, one's the technology economy. And if you don't think the technology economy is thriving, then you're not paying attention. Go try and find a hotel room in, in uh, San Francisco or, or Seattle for less than 400 bucks a night that doesn't have bed bugs. It's amazing what's happening in our uh, the U.S. technology economy. And I would point out that in the technology economy globally, the U.S. continues to be the world leader in the development and creation of new technology, both hardware and software, on all levels globally. Consumers started to spend to 17. There's a number of reasons for that. Um, we're seeing the housing is poised to continue to the upside. Uh, what really happened with is millennials are moving out of the basement. And those who predicted that that would never happen uh, we're just not paying attention to demographics. The bottom line is, is that, is that uh, my parents got married later than my grandparents, uh, and I got married later than my parents, and my children are getting married later than I am in general. What's happened, why is that happening? Well, as life expectancies get longer and education rates uh, get higher, it tends to delay getting married. And that result is millennials got, are getting married later than their parents did. Uh, and there's nothing that drives uh, housing uh, like household formation, like like um, like uh, getting married. So consumers started to spend in 17 as we finally got the demographics. Millennials started to, to, to form households in earnest. And also their grandparents, the, the baby boomers, saw their uh, investment accounts reflate, which made them decide they were going to spend a little bit more money and or even help uh, their grandchildren uh, with that down payment on that first house. We see big box retailers in general continue to deep, uh, disappoint, but e-commerce is just in fuego. Um, it, it literally is growing as fast as uh, the physical infrastructure will allow it to, and quite frankly, as fast as demographics will allow it to. You know, uh, most of the baby boomers will never buy much of anything on uh, via e-commerce uh, because the oldest of them don't even know how to turn a computer on, uh, and millennials uh, will they'll buy almost everything uh, via e-commerce. 
I would point out the trucking data has historically been the most predictive of all the modes, and it's never been more sophisticated. We now know more about what's going on than we ever have. So let's look at some of the freight flows real quick and get to the meat of this. Enough of me philosophizing. Uh, consistently, the best predictor of what's going to happen in the industrial economy has been chemical carload volume via rail, and it's simple. It's almost impossible to make or assemble anything of any mass without consuming some form of chemical, and it's up and to the right. Um, it's been a great predictor of the ISM manufacturing index and is signaling positive uh, activity. Why? Because it means purchasing managers are signing POs. The critic out there could say, well, that's a false positive because you're including petroleum carloads and that's because of fracking. And indeed, that has been a positive uh, contributor to the chemical carload volume in the United States. I would also point out that it's also a positive contributor to the industrial economy. Uh, however, that said, okay, let's take the, what they're saying into account and let's subtract that. If you take chemical carload volume X petroleum carloads, X crude by rail, you get this picture and uh, without crude by rail, chemical volume is still running at levels that are essentially 10% plus higher than they were a year ago. Sign of a continuing growth, continuing expansion in the U.S. industrial economy. Um, you want to know what's going to, how many houses we're going to build? Look at lumber shipments. It's very simple. I was in a, seeing a client in, in uh, Great Britain back in the 06 time frame, and I was pointing out the decline in lumber meant that the housing market in the United States was was uh, the process of uh, uh, going significantly lower. And I'll never forget, he leaned back in his chair and he said, oh, I'll show you all still make houses out of wood. And I was like, well, what do you, how do you make houses out of it? He said, oh, mostly stone and masonry. We deforced it here hundreds of years ago. And I said, well, not US, we still make houses out of wood. Therefore, if I want to know what's gonna happen with housing stars, I look at lumber because you have to get the lumber harvested, the tree has to be harvested, has to be cut into, cut into boards, has to be dried, um, and then shipped to the, the job site before you can begin the construction. Physically, we're seeing that those materials ship via rail, <clears throat> excuse me, up 6% versus where they were a year ago. That means continued strength in housing. I know the last data point was a disappointment to some, but the bottom line is that the ongoing trend is going to be up. <clears throat> excuse me. Best measurement out there right now, uh, available on what's happening in truckload, is the DAT uh, monthly barometers. The, actually, they come out every week. This is the drive in. And what this does is very simple. Uh, as many of you probably are aware, DAT has the largest database of loads posted and loads searched for, and trucks posted and trucks searched for of anyone else in North America. Uh, consistently the largest database by a large margin. We went in and looked at their data and built a barometer. This looks at the balance between those measurements and determines how over demand or over capacitized we are. Um, I look at its ability. Historically, it's done a phenomenal job of predicting the spot market and that you can see that in this data when you state the line up the drive in monthly barometer with the nominal spot market price, it becomes even cl more clear even to the non-mathematician if you look at the year over year uh, change in the spot price. And this is the monthly. I will tell you, you just have to trust me, that the same pattern you've just seen in drive in and spot price uh, exists also for reefer and reefer spot price and flatbed and flatbed spot price. Uh, but I'm not going to bore you with those slides. Uh, those are available uh, through either me or DAT. And the bottom line is there's a very tight relationship. It tells you what's going to happen with spot price. As everyone else in the marketplace also probably is well aware, the magnitude and duration of changes in spot price determine what's going to happen with contract price. It, said another way, if spot price goes up a lot and stays up for a long time, contract price will go up. If it goes down by a lot and stays down for a long time, contract price will come down. But the bottom line is, is that um, uh, the DAT barometers tell us where, what's going to happen to spot price and spot price tells us what's going to happen with contract price. Um, we're finally getting contract spot prices to come back to where they ought to be. Uh, they, there ought to be a gap. It ought to be cheaper to get services on a spot basis than it is a contract basis. And we had a period earlier this year in which in all three modes, 
uh, drive and free for and 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 uh, flatbed, we saw the con the spot price actually get above contract, which is uh, rare for it to happen in any mode, but r even rare for it to happen in all three modes at the same time. Host of factors as to why, we can talk about that later, but the bottom line is, is we're getting back to a more normalized market as contract rates have gone up and spot prices have become less, um, they're still up, but they're just less in, in fuego than, they, than they, they were just a couple of months ago. Here's the drive-in weekly barometer. Uh, and what we're seeing more than anything right now is, is that first we saw uh, people use how to learn how to use the ELDs. Um, and um, we're still more loads than trucks, um, but um, uh, it's a less frenetic uh, search for trucks than it was and um, almost panic levels we saw earlier in the year. Um, and uh, loads posted, uh, loads are being accepted when tendered, fewer loads rejected. And we'll talk, we can talk about that later. Um, our favorite predictor of holiday shopping is the container volume coming in and we're seeing good volume coming into Long Beach LA, which is the longest, largest import container port in the United States. It's a little over a third of the total volume. It's more than two thirds of the, almost two thirds of the West Coast volume alone. And we're seeing up year over year levels. Uh, you can see that it is represented in the head haul index. I'm a huge fan of what Freight Waves is doing with their sonar product. Uh, and you can see how it affected the head haul index, uh, that container volume positively affected the head haul index coming out of, of the Southern California market first. And then as rails, as, as trucks are moving those containers out, out of that market towards other uh, uh, places to distribution centers. Uh, and then you saw it also begin to more recently affect uh, um, uh, rail markets. So, you know, the BN is taking a container from Long Beach LA uh, to Chicago and, and, and as those containers start to land there, it drives up the head haul index coming out of Joliet, Illinois. So you're seeing uh, rail destination, what I call rail destination markets or intermodal rail destination markets, such as Chicago, Atlanta, Dallas, you're all seeing this kind of spike up as, as you're seeing depicted here in this head haul index. Uh, again, another freight wave sonar um, data uh, chart. Clearly real time shows you what's going on in the marketplace. Uh, DAT barometer, again, another DAT barometer. This is exactly what's going on in reefer. Um, and uh, again, we're seeing uh, more loads than trucks, not the frenetic levels we saw earlier in the year, but still uh, indications that we're going to see some continued strength in spot pricing and, and contract pricing. Uh, loads still exceed capacity. Same has been true with flatbed, but we've had a little bit of different uh, happen here. I would point out that flatbed has had more difficult time uh, figuring out how to use ELDs. Uh, than the other modes, in part because they have a smaller trailer to tractor ratio, in part because uh, one to one, 1 1.1 to one instead of 2.5 to one like you'd find a drive in, in part because the driver, for I think obvious reasons, wants to be involved in the loading. Uh, if it's not uh, secured properly and he hits the brakes, the, the load comes shifts forward and kills him. Um, uh, and beyond the uh, liability of the other motoring public, uh, the driver wants to be involved in loading the, loading the truck. And, and so that eats into his driving time and into his 14 hour window in which he can accomplish his driving. Uh, and that results is the, that uh, flatbeds have had more difficulty adapting to the ELD, use of ELDs than any other mode, but even flatbed is beginning to figure it out. One, two, uh, the US industrial economy is still strong, still in a growth mode, but not anywhere near what it was in May, uh, it had gotten to in May and June. And uh, what I've been telling folks is it's a lot like, you know, that first cool day in the fall or that first warm day in the spring. You know, we're used to the weather being 95, 100, 105 degrees, 60 degrees seems cold. Uh, we're used to the weather being single digits, uh, eight, nine, 10, 11, 15 degrees outside, bitter cold, uh, 60 degrees seems balmy and warm. Um, I would tell you that right now, uh, the demand environment is still balmy and warm. It's still 60, 70 degrees. It's just that we were used to extraordinarily high, um, 100 plus degree weather uh, with a, an enormous amount of humidity in the economy. And that, uh, that result is, is that um, 
as demand comes down to more regular levels of growth and the flatbed community begins to use how to learn how to use their equipment we've seen a more rational balance still still more loads than trucks but but not to the just extraordinarily extreme level that we saw in may and june all right so what else changes things ideas ideas change the world uh, that sounds almost trite to say but it is indeed the fact um i love to point this out to people who manage money because they s don't seem to have ever figured this out this is almost seems intuitive to most people who route freight, but it's important to, to, uh, to point out the obvious to all of you. And that is, is that, that the, the density is the destiny. What do I mean by that? If you look at the world in a value to density spectrum, so I've got the lowest value, the highest density goods out there. I've got creek gravel, trash on one end of this spectrum on the other end of that spectrum i've got high value low density i've got the latest greatest computer chip the human heart that needs to be transplanted all the goods in the transportation spectrum fall somewhere in that once i start looking at the world that way you notice several things one that most goods are becoming higher value lower density in their very nature the ibm selectric typewriter becomes the laptop computer becomes the ipad two um New goods, all the new goods we're creating are high value low density. We're not creating uh, new kinds of creek gravel. We're creating smartphones. And third, what I call the durability disposability paradox. And that is, if I ship you the cement and steel to build a building or a road or a bridge, I'm not going to need to ship it to you again for decades. Uh, maybe not ever in, in my lifetime. Um, but if I air freight you, and that's how I ship you a new smartphone, what am I going to do within three years? Uh, I'm going to air freight you another cell phone. So the higher the value, the lower the density it is, the more disposable it tends to be. The lower the value, the uh, higher the density, the more durable it tends to be. And that result is you'll, you can look at studies by Boeing and others about how uh, worldwide air freight tonnage has grown at, at, a, at a pace roughly 2x worldwide GDP, roughly 2x world trade, and they'll say things like, well, of course, this isn't sustainable. And I sit there and think, well, maybe it actually is. Um, what I would, why is this usable? This is usable. You think, well, this is intuitive. Thank you for pointing out the obvious, Donald. But why this is usable is is that it's driving activity that otherwise wouldn't be predicted. One is this, we did a study uh, using some Amazon distribution centers. And if I go to a, say a Walmart distribution center and I look at the trailers going into it and the trailers coming out of it, it's roughly one-to-one. -one. They may come in full of one product and go out full of a host of products headed to a store, but it's a roughly one-to-one -one ratio. When you go to look at an e-fulfillment uh, warehouse, what happens is, is you see roughly eight to 18 times as many trailers coming out of it as you do coming into it. Why is that? Well, because they're packed very nicely, neatly, very densely going in, but going out, they're surrounded by pillows of air. It's, a, it's one little product in a big cardboard box. And that result is, uh, all of those trailers going out are cubing out long before they would ever weigh out. And they take up literally eight to 18 times as many trailers. Now, uh, I understand they're not going very far. They're not going more than uh, uh, 100, 150 miles at most probably out of that, those, those centers. However, that said, that's a change in the patterns that, that most people haven't stopped and thought about and acknowledged. Uh, the, the last thing I tell you about this, this, all of that data is this. If you want to know which of your customers are going to A, grow the fastest over the next 5, 10, 15 years, and B, be willing to pay you for service, the answer is the higher the value, the lower the density of the products they're having you ship for them, the more they're going to be willing to pay for service because your cost of transportation is a small percentage of the cost of goods delivered. And the more likely it is what they're shipping it, volumes will grow over time. So here's my predictions about the futures that we'll do Q&A. Uh, the driver market is gonna stay incredibly tough until it doesn't. And that it doesn't is when we get to more automation, autonomous trucks, 
which I think will happen faster than most. There's so many saying, oh, well, it won't happen in my lifetime. Well, I can't imagine it'll ever happen. Well, let me tell you this. 20 years ago, 20 years is a long time. 20 years ago, my BlackBerry read an email one line at a time as I scrolled up and down versus the smartphone we all have today. TL pricing power, uh, eight to 12% this year. Then we're then looking for maybe three to four next at most. And I've been seriously considered lowering that estimate recently, get based upon more recent data. Uh, the pricing power that's been achieved by the industry has not been used to enhance margin. It's been used to hire and retain driver and lower the average age of fleet, which has been successful at uh, lowering significantly, if not growing fleet, certainly lowering significantly unseated truck count. And the net result is we do have the addition of some additional capacity. I said this for several years going into the rule change, and I continue to hold fast. Electronic onboard recorders, ELDs, whatever you want to call them, have a big impact on capacity initially. But they've had an even bigger impact on equipment visibility, bigger impact on loading and unloading behavior. Everyone said it would reduce permanently capacity. I continue to vehemently disagree with that because it would be the, one of the first times in history that you'd applied additional technology to an industry and it became less efficient. That just doesn't make sense. And as uh, uh, a good friend of mine at A.G. Edwards uh, used to always say, calamities well anticipated seldom are and everybody knew the rule change was coming. So everyone had chance to plan for it and adapt. Autonomous trucks are further away. That's going. They're going to happen in our lifetime. But they're, it's because insurance companies will like make less money, and because the who is responsible for the uh, accident when it happens is going to shift. And as a result, you'll have parties that will fight it. Uh, not only will the railroads fight it, but the insurance companies will fight it, and so will the OEMs. Consolidation and transportation will continue because in, uh, it makes sense. To, uh, there is. Um, uh, so many reasons from a operating perspective, from a capital perspective, from a technology perspective, there's leverage. And so we're going to see that continue. Um, we're in the next stage of economic growth. We're going to have ebbs and flows. But as I pointed out, we're still early in this cycle. This is, I still see us as being in the first 18 months to two years of both the consumer cycle and the industrial cycle, even though the industrials have cooled a little bit recently. Inflation's DOA for the foreseeable future, as I pointed out, for uh, probably more time and slides than I should have. Value brand, brand names continues to decline. Think about brand names that have been created in the last 10 years that we didn't even know existed. They're now dominant brands. Uh, the last 20 years, things that didn't even exist. Um, biggest current threat to the economy and the economic security continues to be trade war. Um, and we'll see how it meters out, but, but the economic history is very, very clear. Uh, the 1929 recession became the Great Depression because of trade tariffs and trade wars. Uh, the Smoot Hawley uh, trade war, trade tariffs is what created the Great Depression. Um, so if we're negotiating with the Chinese and that's all this ends up being is bluster, that's one thing. If we end up in a prolonged, drawn out trade war uh, between the, nation, the world's two largest economies, that's another matter entirely. So open for questions if you have them. Um, we're back over here. We have quite a few questions that have come in. Um, I know we don't have a lot of time to answer them. So if you have any other questions, you can submit them through the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, as well as submit them to um, our email, marketing at arrivelogistics.com. And we'll make sure that if they're not answered today, they're answered through follow-up emails. But let me um, ask you just a few that have come in right here. Um, the first one is, in the current state, contract prices are quite a bit higher than spot pricing. Some folks are calling for rate increases in 2019. How could this be possible as the gap between spot pricing and contract pricing continues to widen? Well, um, it depends entirely on whether or not it continues to widen and by how much it widens. Um, what I will tell you is, is that that uh, uh, as I said earlier, contract pricing is supposed to be higher than spot pricing. That's the normal gist of things. And a more standard gap has recently opened up 
Uh, now, if that gap continues to widen and widen significantly, um, then yeah, it's possible that, that pricing could be flat to, to even slightly, slightly negative in 2019. But I would note that if we go look at our uh, barometers, the all, uh, all three modes, weekly barometers suggest that there are still more loads than trucks, which would indicate that while it was, it's normal for spot to come back and find a, 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 a consolid, what I would call a consolidation level, uh, it doesn't mean that spot's just gonna continue to fall. Now, if those barometers in the coming weeks were to fall below 50, then uh, yeah, Katie bar the door on that prediction, uh, spot prices will continue to fall from where they are. Um, and, then, and then contract pricing uh, going up would be indeed uh, uh, at risk next year. Uh, but right now it looks so far on the data as if uh, we're just getting back to a, a more normal uh, environment in which there are more loads than trucks, but not to the extreme level that we had earlier in the year. Question is how as shippers can we take advantage of this information for our operations? Where do you see the biggest opportunity? Um, I think the biggest opportunity is to look at what it is you do and look at the freight flows that uh, either are directly applicable or compete with uh, to know what's going on in the economy from kind of a macro level. And then from a micro level, uh, look at data provided by uh, folks like FreightWave Sonar uh, or DAT um and and look at it uh, to provide just competitive intelligence um on what's happening in your specific lanes in which you're trying to book freight uh that lets you know whether or not you need to be a little bit more aggressive in sealing and signing and sealing uh agreements with your 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 shippers your your uh service providers or you need to be a little bit more reticent a little bit more uh, willing to to uh, be patient and demand uh, a better price. Um, but, uh, you know, technology, the, the, the data has never been better uh, than what you're able to get from people like, as I said, uh, the, the FreightWave Sonar product or DAT product. Um, and uh, so you're, uh, uh, you should take advantage of that and, and use it to gain a marketplace advantage in knowing how to position yourself as you negotiate for your services. Um, another question we have here is, do you see any major signs in current freight flow that concern you about the state of our economy? Uh, no, actually, I don't. You know, that's the interesting thing. Um, uh, as I said, it's a bit like uh, having uh, a long period of very hot weather and then suddenly it's 60 degrees and it seems cold. Um, all of the, the signals that historically have uh, been the precursors to contraction in freight uh, are not there. Um, all of the things that have led to continued expansion, maybe not as a, a, a faster rate of expansion as we saw earlier this year, but continued expansion are in place with one exception. And that is, as I mentioned, um, tariffs and trade war. Um, uh, as we are in the midst of uh, a bit of a game of chicken if you will, with uh, uh, the world's second largest economy. Um, so if we end up getting this settled and some type of a trade agreement, okay, fine. But the longer this uh, continues, the, the greater the risk becomes that indeed this leads to a, uh, 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 if not a recession, a, uh, at least a mild contraction in the U.S. economy, and, and arguably it could be far worse than that. But, but like I said, again, it's too early to tell. All of the current data is suggesting that we're just not growing as fast as we did in May and June, but that we're still growing, and all of the things outside tariffs uh, uh, are still predicting positive. So um, uh, the short answer is, uh, unless we engage in a full-fledged trade war, um, uh, I'm pretty confident about uh, continued economic growth. Okay, um, and then we just had another one come in. Um, is driver retention having a significant effect on truck capacity? It is uh, for one basic reason, uh, is driver pay has gone up and gone up and gone up 
uh, we've gotten to for many fleets uh, to a price point at which um, they're getting paid uh, well enough not to shop around. Um, and um, let's face it, you know, when uh, anytime uh, any driver of any experience level, whether it be beginner or years of experience, goes from fleet one fleet to another, there's a, always at least a little disruption. Um, even if a, you got a driver who's got 10 years experience and goes from one big fleet to another big fleet, uh, the first week or two he's at the new fleet, he's not going to be as productive as he would have been just because he's relearning the new system, the new routes, et cetera. Um, okay. Uh, what are your thoughts on lowering the age of drivers from 21 to 18 and how would that impact driver ability? It would increase. Uh, I don't think I'm saying anything uh, that hasn't been well uh, thought out and talked about from people. Uh, I, I remember the first person I heard years and decades ago make a very, very compelling argument for this was Don Snyder. Um, God rest his soul. Um, and uh, we, we allow 18 year olds with proper training uh, um, to um, put on a helmet and carry an M16 and, 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 and uh, go into battle for us. Uh, why can't we, with proper training um, and oversight, um, allow them to, to drive a truck? Uh, I'm not saying that all uh, 18 year olds are responsible enough uh, to drive a truck. Um, Hell, I know plenty of 40 and 50 year olds that aren't responsible enough to drive a truck. But the bottom line is, is, is that if we make it a possible first career choice and not a, a, a backup career choice, uh, that's good uh, for truck driving as a profession. Uh, and also it, it opens up uh, several years of demographics of, of individuals that uh, would be available to trucking that just currently are not. Uh, and there's no uh, data out there that suggests that with proper training and oversight that, a, that an 18 or 19 year old is any less safe than a 21, 22 year old. It's just an arbitrary rule that like the calculation of GDP and how we account for the government is, is um, arguably antiquated. Cool. Um, we're going to do one last question and then we'll make sure that all of the other questions submitted are followed up by email as well as you can um, submit follow-up questions to us through marketing at arrivalogistics.com. But our last question is, as a supplier going into RFP season, what should we expect to see in dry and refrigerated freight rates, both full truckload and less than truckload in 2019? Um, you're going to uh, see continued uh, request for increased rate and 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 uh, rate pressure because there are more loads than trucks, um, but and not anywhere near uh, the percentage increase um, that we saw uh, over the past 12, 18 months. Um, uh, so will rates still on a contract basis be positive? Um, yeah, I think they will be. Um, um, as I said earlier, unless we see a just uh, co collapse in those barometers below 50 and followed by spot rates, uh, not finding a floor, but in indeed continuing to, to, to decline dramatically. The fear that's injected right now into the market is just because spot has come down uh, fairly quickly, uh, but it should have, it needed to. Um, and uh, human beings are a bit linear in our thought. The last data point is necessarily the most valid when indeed it's not, it's just the most recent. And that recency bias has a lot of people thinking that the current, the most recent decline in spot is going to continue. And uh, the long-term history of the data, the economic, the economic history of the market is not that, that, that uh, spot should find a floor fairly soon. And as it does, then, uh, uh, the approach to those contracts should change. Well, um, thank you so much, Donald. We have a, quite a few other questions, so we'll make sure that they're all answered through follow-up emails within the next few days and early next week. Um, we'll also have the slides and a live recording available on our site that we will send a link out to everyone that's attended. So we'll make sure to get that to you um, as soon as we can. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for hosting this. And um, please shoot any other follow-up questions our way and we'll make sure we get them answered. Thank you.